Hello grade 12 psychology class. Welcome back to another lesson. We have lesson three, the senses, part one. So again, we're gonna have a part two, which will be lesson four, but here we are, so let's get into it. Uh, the senses, so in addition to the five that we're familiar with, vision, hearing, taste, smell, and touch, there are several skin senses uh, and two internal senses. So we usually have all the skin senses as part of touch, which would be pressure, heat, uh, pain. Uh, those are all within touch, but then there's also the internal senses, the vestibular, which is balance, and the kinesthetic, uh, which is your body. Those two we will talk about more in the next lesson. Today we are going to finish on, uh, for finish, focus on key points one and four, which is vision, and hearing, these are the ones that we know the most about. Um, each type of sensory receptor takes some sort of stimulus, light, chemical molecules, sound waves, pressure, whatever it may be, and converts it into chemical electrical messages that can be transmitted by the nervous system, which we learned about in the last unit, and interpreted by the brain. So it takes the stimulus, turns it into a message, sends it to the brain where we can interpret or perceive what it means in relation to all of the other senses that we are having at the time. So vision, light enters the eye through the pupil and reaches the lens. So essentially it goes through the hole in your eye and goes through a clear part. Um, it is a flexible structure and it focuses the light on the retina, which is the back of the eye. Okay, here we have the pupil with the lens, it goes through and focuses it on the retina, which is the back of the eye. Uh, the retina contains rods and cones. These rods and cones are the things that um, actually transmit impulses of light um, to your brain. So it'll take in light, take in the stimulus, and then send that impulse to your brain through the op optic nerve. Uh, cones require more light than rods before they begin to respond, so they work in daylight. And while the rods are more sensitive, they are the basis for night vision. You have a lot more cones than rods, so you see better during the day than during the night. So we have a small child. Uh, the light goes into the eye and then appears on the back of the retina where the rods and the cones are. It's actually an inverted image, so your eye actually, your brain flips it around for you. So everything you're seeing is inverted, but it's actually not so that you can, your brain actually does it for you. And these are the rods and the cones at the back. So this would be the retina and we are catching the light and turning that into uh, information that our brain can actually perceive. So again, we have the pupil, which is the hole. We have the lens, which focuses the light on the retina. The retina has the rods and the cones that ch uh, changes that information into something that can be sent down your optic nerve and you can actually interpret as vision. Uh, so sometimes people have a color deficiency or they are colorblind in some way. So that's key point two. When some or all of a person's cones do not function properly, he or she is said to be color deficient. There are several kinds of color deficiency. Most color deficient people see some colors. There's very rarely a time when someone sees no colors at all. Uh, for example, people will have trouble distinguishing between red and green. Um, there is even fewer people. Um, a few people have no trouble with red and green, but cannot distinguish between yellow and blue. So there are different types of color deficiency. Rarely are you completely color deficient. Uh, some tests here for you. Can you see the numerals in the dotted pattern? Uh, with normal vision, this is no problem, but those who are color deficient in red, green, will only see random patches of color. So what is the cause of color deficiency? Pause here and answer. But the cause is some kind of lack or problem with the rods and the cones on your retina. Uh, here we have another activity. Um, I want you to pause it after we're done reading this and and do the activity if you will. So stare steadily at the lowest right hand star for about 45 seconds and then stare at a blank piece of paper. You'll see a negative image of this figure and this occurs because the receptors for green, black, and yellow become fatigued. Essentially they become tired of constantly firing. They run out of juice essentially when you're staring in one spot 
and allows the complementary colors of each to predominate uh, uh, when you stare at the white piece of paper. So when you shift your uh, gaze to a blank piece of paper, um, you'll see something pretty cool actually. So go ahead and do that here and we'll shift to the next slide right away. So binocular fusion. So bi means two, ocular is eye, and fusion means bringing together. So we are talking about having two eyes brought together, or information from two eyes uh, fused into one so we can interpret it. So because we have two eyes and they're located about two and a half inches apart, uh, the visual system receives two images and instead of seeing double of everything like you actually are interpreting two of me right now uh, your brain perceives only one so instead of seeing a uh, double we see a single image a composite view of the two eyes the combination of the two images into one is called binocular fusion so the fusion of the images from both eyes not only does the visual system receive two images, but there's also a difference between the images on the retina. And this difference is, difference is called retinal disparity. So the difference between the images on your eyes is retinal disparity. And you can demonstrate that here. Um, if you've ever you know, held your hand up to a building or a flagpole and you've covered it, um, with one eye, you know, but then you close the other eye and you open it and it's shifted. That is because you are seeing two different images in your brain and they are combining them into one uh, so that you do not see double. Um, you can do this at any time with any person, just hold up your thumb and cover them and then open one eye and close the other. Uh, so this retinal disparity or the difference between the two is essentially your sense of depth perception. Um, your brain interprets a large retinal disparity um, it means that it's close, right? If there's a huge difference between what the right eye and the left eye are seeing, that means the object must be nearby. So I've got my hand over here. There's a huge difference between what my right eye and what my left eye are seeing. That means it must be very close. However, if I have it out here, there's a less of a difference between what my right eye and my left eye are seeing, so it's farther away. And as you know, you get a house that's farther away or a grain elevator that's farther away, uh, there will be even less difference between the two images and that'll tell you that it is even more distant. So retinal disparity is really key for depth perception. On to key point four, which is hearing. So hearing doesn't depend on light. It depends on vibrations in the air. We call these sound waves. So sound waves from the air pass through various bones until they reach the inner ear which contain tiny hair-like cells that move back and forth. These cells moving around are t what tell us, uh, our brain, what pitch the sound is and what the, how loud the sound is. So it changes these vibrations into signals that travel through the auditory nerve to the brain. Again, what we talked about in the last unit. So here we have a picture of an ear. We have the sound waves coming into the ear and going down the ear canal. So we have the eardrum, this light part here, and then we have our hearing bones. Don't worry too much about what they're called. Just know that they pick up the vibrations and transfer it into the cochlear area where these little hairs are. And these hairs transfer signals down the auditory nerve and they make these signals based on the vibrations that they're getting from the hammer from the anvil and from the stirrup. So your ear funnels the sound down your ear, it vibrates the bones, and then your cochlea interprets those sounds by vibrating little hairs. So the sound will vibrate, depending on what the sound is and how loud it is, it'll vibrate the cochlea different amounts. That's how you interpret what the different sounds are. So uh, loudness is determined by the amplitude of the sound waves or how large the sound waves are. Um, essentially, if it's a higher amplitude, we get a loud, louder sound. Uh, if the waves are larger, the sound is louder. Uh, and this sound or sound pressure, the strength or sound pressure is measured in decibels. So the human, uh, humans can hear from zero decibels, which is very soft, 
to about 140 decibels, which is as loud as a jet plane taking off. As you go up 10 decibels, it doubles in how loud something is. So the difference between zero and 10 um, is not the same as the difference between 100 and 110. It doubles every single time you go up 10 decibels. Uh, so we have threshold of hearing, breathing is 10, very quiet is 20. We have an automobile at 80. Um, when you start to get up here into the 90 to 140 range, you have definite um, damage to the to hearing. It's painful sometimes. A rock band uh, at 15 feet, uh, subway train at 15 feet, all extremely loud, 100 to 120 decibels. Um, so that would be um, hugely louder than a normal conversation, essentially. Uh, the pitch, or how high or low the sound is, depends on the wave frequency, or the rate of vibration. How close are the waves together? Not how strong are they, but are they um, packed tightly, or are they far apart? Um, the frequency, or the rate of vibration of the medium through which the sound wave is transmitted. Low sounds produce deep frequency, uh, deep bass sounds, and high frequencies produce shrill sounds, or higher sounds. If you hear a sound that's composed of a combination of frequencies, you can hear both of them uh, because they are making different waves. So that's why we can hear a harmony or you can hear notes together in a chord. You can hear the pitches um, all at the same time. They don't necessarily cancel each other out. So hearing is sound waves. The uh, How loud it is depends on how large the wave is and the pitch of it, or how high or low it is, depends on how tightly packed or how loosely packed the waves are. We have some important terms for you, and then you have some hearing research, but again, if you have any questions, you know where to find me. Uh, thanks so much for watching, everyone. I will see you soon.